Hello everyone, my name is John Sierra and I am a Tolkien scholar. What that means is that I study and constantly learn about the works of J.R.R. Tolkien and I'm generally the guy that you can come to with questions and I'm here to answer your questions about Tolkien's work, whether it's The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, The Silmarillion, or any of his other works. I'm generally speaking the guy that you can uh, ask questions of. And if you have a question, you can feel free to ask it right there in the comments uh, and I get to as many of those as I can. Usually, in a timely fashion, sometimes it takes me a few days to be like, okay, now I got to read up on comments. But, you know, it is what it is. I try my best. Um, uh, if you want to be featured in a video, though, you'll have to go through Quora. There is a link to my Quora account in the description. It's very easy to make an account there. You might even have one already because you can sign up with the Facebook. You could sign up with uh, Twitter, uh, I think, and you can sign up with your Google account. And, uh, if you ask any sort of question related to Tolkien, whether, you know, Lord of the Rings or whatever, even the movies or the TV show, there, when you ask the question, there's going to be a list of people on there, and it's going to say, these are the people that are most likely to, to give you a good answer, and my name is going to be on or near the top of the list. Uh, so just quick channel update. We've been doing really well, getting a lot of comments, getting a lot of engagement. I've been really happy with it. We're, as of this recording, at 1,684 uh, subscribers. It's probably going to be more by the time I edit it, and definitely more by the time this actually uh, goes up. And uh, yeah, so I just want to let you know that that's doing really, really well. Um, I'll, I, uh, I had this whole thing about when we reach 10,000, we might, um, well, well, not that we might, but that I would uh, start doing streams on here because we do, uh, I do Tolkien streams. There's a link to my Twitch account in the description as well. And generally on Thursdays, we sometimes do Tolkien streams, but basically twice a month. Uh, the first Thursday of every month, I meet with Matt Richardson and Sid Kemp for our podcast, The Council of Tolkien. And of course, if you miss these streams, you can always watch them on YouTube when they go up here, um, which will usually be at least a week or so later. And uh, unless you're a member, in that case, it's, it's a lot faster because members see the videos much, much faster. And then, of course, uh, at least once a month on a Thursday, uh, usually the second or third uh, around there, Thursday, we will do a reading stream, and we did, did the Fellowship of the Ring that recently went up to everybody, and uh, I'm going to be doing that uh, fairly soon as well for the second portion. But I probably would get better results streaming here on YouTube. It was a bit of a um, technical issue that I can resolve. It's just a bit costly, and that's why I wanted to wait to um, stream to YouTube because of the cost involved in doing it is a bit more than doing it on Twitch, uh, which is which is not at all, really. Um, so I wanted to make it where I could, you know, justify it from a financial standpoint. But seeing the way the revenue is, um, I think we could get to that probably long before we get to uh, that point. We're at 10,000 subscribers, so let's make the goal 5,000, you know, and uh, once we reach 5,000, um, we'll do something special there. But as for um, streaming here, as well as Twitch, doing a simultaneous thing, I think that um, that will happen sooner rather than later. Anyway, we want to get to a reading, and uh, I got a comment kind of recently asking me about reading readings that I do at the start of each video and or the question and answer videos at least and how they wanted to hear more of unfinished tales and and possibly also book of lost tales the problem with the book of lost tales is that i don't currently have on me a physical copy of it i have a digital copy of it and i could read from that it just seems to just i don't know without having the book in your hand it just seems to lose some of that but maybe i will read from some of the digital copies to read things like the book of lost tales but i have unfinished tales here and I wanted to read a little bit of, of this first story in here of Tour and his coming to Gondolin. And this is basically the first part of what was going to be the final revision of the Fall of Gondolin, where it was going to be a full, fleshed out novel with details and everything. Not the truncated story as told in the Silmarillion, and not the. Um, sort of like very old draft that you see in the Book of Lost Tales Part 2. 
And this is a really excellent read, and it ends with Tour actually reaching Gondolin. But the part that I'm going to read is him coming to speak to Olmo, because Tour is a very important character. In my opinion, he is the linchpin of the entire Legendarium, not just of the um, the Silmarillion, but of, of the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings and everything. Because um, well, I, I wrote a thesis on this, but everything that happens before Tour leads to his birth and everything that happens after tour comes from him everything important at least the only thing that doesn't come from him that is very important has to do with hobbits and uh i had a, a different sort of a paper on that but uh the tour one um i can't wait to publish it in some form i uh, me and matt and sid are, are working on publishing some stuff so it would definitely be in there but let me read the part here where Tour speaks to Olmo. Olmo is one of the Valar. And Tour is the only mortal man to speak with any of the Valar, other than uh, Melkor. Melkor doesn't count, really, there, because Hurin spoke to him. Uh, but he's he's cast out of the Valar at that point. He's still a Vala, but he was not part of their order. Um, we might make the argument that perhaps Beren may have spoken to Namo, but we aren't told that. We know Luthien spoke to, to Namo, or she sang for him, but we don't know if Beren actually spoke to him. And Beren, you know, Beren was dead, and you could say that possibly all men pass through Mandos and may speak to Namo in that sense, but a man, a mortal man with no elvish heritage whatsoever, in during his life within the circles of the world, speaking to one of the Valar, very interesting. So I'm going to read that part here. Now Tur felt his feet drawn to the sea strand, and he went down by long stairs to a wide shore upon the north side of Tarusness. And as he went, he saw that the sun was sinking low into a great black cloud that came up over the rim of the darkening sea. And it grew cold, and there was a stirring and murmur of a storm to come. And Tur stood upon the shore, and the sun was like a smoky fire behind the menace of the sky. And it seemed to him that a great wave rose far off and rolled toward the land, but wonder held him and he remained there unmoved. And the wave came toward him, and upon it lay a mist of shadow. Then suddenly as it drew near, it curled and broke, and rushed forward in long arms of foam. But where it had broken, there stood dark against the rising storm a living shape of great height and majesty. Then Tur bowed in reverence, for it seemed to him that he beheld a mighty king. A tall crown he wore like silver, from which his long hair fell down as foam glimmering in the dusk, and he cast back the gray mantle that hung about him like a, like a mist. Behold, he was clad in a gleaming coat, close-fitted as the mail of a mighty fish, and in kirtle of deep green that flashed and flickered with a sea fire that strode slowly toward the land. In this manner the dweller of the deep, who the Noldor named Olmo, Lord of Waters, showed himself to Tur, son of Hur, in the house of Hador, beneath Vinyamar. He set no foot upon the shore, but standing knee-deep in the shadowy sea, he spoke to Tur, and then for the light of his eyes and for the sound of his deep voice that came, as it seemed from the foundations of the world, fear fell upon Tur, and he cast himself down upon the sand. Arise, Tur, son of Hur, said Ulmo. Fear not my wrath, though long I have called to thee unheard, and setting out at last thou hast tarried on thy journey hither. In the spring thou should have stood here, but now a fell winter cometh soon from the land of the enemy. Haste thou must her learn, and the pleasant road that I have designed for thee must be changed, for my counsels have been scorned, and a great evil creeps upon the valley of Syrian, and already a host of foes has come between thee and thy goal. What then is my goal, lord? said Tur. That which thy heart hath ever sought, answered Elmo to find Turgon, and look upon the hidden city, for thou art arrayed thus to be my messenger, even in the arms which long ago I decreed for thee. Yet now thou must law under shadow pass through peril, wrap thyself therefore in this cloak, and cast it never aside until thou come to thy journey's end. Then it seemed to Tur that Olmo parted his grey mantle, and cast to him a lappet, and as it fell about him, it was for him a great cloak, wherein he might wrap himself over all from head to foot. Thus thou shalt walk under my shadow, said Ulmo, but tarry no more, for in the lands of Anar and the fires of Melkor it will not endure. Will thou take up thy errand? I will, my lord, said Tur. 
Then I will set words in thy mouth to say unto Turgon, said Olmo. But first I will teach thee, and some things thou shalt hear which no man else hath heard, nay, not even the mighty among the Eldar. And Olmo spoke to Tur of Valinor and its darkening, and the exile of the Noldor, and the doom of Mandos, and the hiding of the Blessed Realm. But behold, said he, in the armour of fate, as the children of earth name it, there is ever a rift, and in the walls of doom, a breach, until the full making, which ye call the end. So it shall be while I endure a secret voice that gainsayeth, and a light where darkness was decreed. Therefore, though in the days of this darkness I seem to oppose the will of my brethren, the lords of the West, that is my part among them, to which I was appointed ere the making of the world, yet doom is strong, and the shadow of the enemy lengthens, and I am diminished, until in Middle-earth I am become no more now than a secret whisper. The waters that run westward wither, and their springs are poisoned, and my power withdraws from the land, for elves and men grow blind and deaf to me, because of the might of Melkor. And now the curse of Mandos hastens to its fulfillment, and all the works of the Noldor shall perish, and every hope which they build shall crumble. The last hope alone is left, and hope that they have not looked for and have not prepared, and that hope lieth in thee, for so I have chosen. Then shall Turgon not stand against Morgoth, as all the Eldar yet hope, said Tur. And what wouldst thou of me, Lord, if I come now to Turgon? For though I am indeed willing to do as my father, and stand by that king in his need, yet of little avail shall I be a mortal man alone, among so many and so valiant of the high folk of the West. If I choose to send thee, Tur, son of Hur, then believe not that what thy one sword is not worth the sending. For the valour of the Adain the elves shall ever remember, as the ages lengthen, marvelling that they gave life so freely, of which they had so little on earth. But it is not for thy valour only that I send thee, but to bring into the world a hope beyond thy sight, and a light that shall pierce the darkness. And as Ulmo said these things, the mutter of the storm rose to a great cry, and the wind mounted, and the sky grew black, and the mantle of the Lord of Waters streamed out like a flying cloud. Go now, said Ulmo, lest the sea devour thee, for Ose obeys the will of Mandos, and he is wroth, being a servant of the doom. As thou commandest, said Tur, but if I escape the doom, what world should I say to Turgon? If thou come to him, answered Ulmo, then the words shall arise in thy mind and thy mouth shall speak as I would. Speak and fear not, and thereafter do as thy heart and valour lead thee. Hold fast to my mantle, for thus thou shalt be guarded. And I will send one to thee out of the wrath of Ose, and thus shalt thou be guided. Yea, the last mariner of the last ship that shall seek into the west until the rising of the star. Go now back to the land. Then there was a noise of thunder, and lightning flared over the sea, and Tur beheld Olmo standing among the waves as a tower of silver flickering with darting flames, and he cried against the wind, I go, Lord, yet now my heart yearneth rather to the sea. So there's a lot to talk about here. Really interesting stuff. Um, as I said, Tur is sort of the linchpin of the entire story, uh, not just of Morgoth's fall, but of, but of Sauron's as well in the Third Age, and everything sort of comes from him. And he says, it's not, you know, almost says to him, it's not just for your valor, it's for what you will bring forth in this world, a light in the darkness. And he's speaking of Tur's children, because Tur will go there and he will fall in love with the elven princess, and they will marry and they will have a son named Yarundil. And Yarundil will be a star in the sky as he carries the Silmaril in his flying ship. And Olmo has already seen all this. I've always said that Olmo, out of all the Valar, has the greatest foresight and he even says that you are the only one until the star and he's speaking of the Arundel there and he makes a few other references here that are really really interesting when you sort of go back and review this with a sort of a more educated mind he speaks of Ose obeying the will of Mandos because um but they all sort of obey the will of Namal Mandos that, you know, Valinor shall be, um, shall be, uh, uh, veiled 
and that nobody should get there. And he's like, uh, Ose is going to, you know, these guys, they are the last ship until until the star, until Yarendil sails to the west. And Yarendil and Elwing, his wife, will actually make it there. And um, what's really interesting about it is he's saying that he's going to save one person from Ose's wrath. Now, Ose sort of works for Olmo, but Ose is doing what Namal Mandos would have him do, whereas Olmo, he's sort of a little bit of a rebel. Not in the way that Melkor is. He's not against the Valar because he's evil. He's against the Valar because he knows where they've gone wrong. And he's wiser than most of them. And he's sort of different. He's sort of apart from them. He doesn't marry, ever. Um, there are only two Valar that never get married. Other than Melkor, of course. Like I said, Melkor sort of doesn't count. Melkor tried to marry Varda. She, had, uh, she wanted nothing to do with him. She married his brother Manwe instead. And uh, they all sort of paired off. And there are two... Valar and one uh, the other one it's not important she's not that important in this well she's important but not in this sort of point that I'm making the the words in the Silmarillion in Valaquenta say that she lives alone which is fine but then with Ulmo it doesn't say Ulmo lives alone it says Ulmo is alone he's not just alone in the sense of that he doesn't have a wife he is alone in every sense of the word he's sort of apart from them he's different and you see it here. He doesn't agree with the doom of Mandos. He doesn't agree with the decisions that have been made. He thinks that they've gone about things the wrong way. And he's putting it right. He's sort of meddling in things that he's really not supposed to meddle with. But he knows that it's the right thing to do. And from Tur, we get Yarundil. And from Yarundil, we get Elrond and Elros. And then if you think about it, Elrond and everything that that leads from, that's that's huge. And then Elros, from which comes Numenor, all the way down the lines of the kings, the lords of Vidunia, all the way down to Aragorn. And there's very few human or elf characters in the Lord of the Rings that don't have some direct or indirect connection to Tur. And Olmo knows this. And I, like I said, in my, in my thesis, which I said I hope to publish someday soon, um... I speak about the times before Tour and how everything sort of led into him. And that's why I call him the linchpin, because everything led into him and then everything flowed out of him, except for the hobbits. The hobbits are a different story, and that, that's a different sort of paper. But anyway, I've talked long enough. Let's get to your questions. We have 15 questions to get through today. So uh, let's start with the first one. Our first question comes in uh, by the request of somebody who goes by the name Fury, who asks, what if Morgoth is still alive? He is, sort of. And I, I like this question. Um, this is the sort of question that many Tolkien scholars would sort of dismiss, and they would say, oh, well, you know, this person didn't read it, they didn't understand it, this and that. But I, I think that there's actually a bit of good thought here, because it made me think of the definition of alive in a sense. A death in the world of Tolkien isn't merely a bodily demise of which the immortal elves and even incarnate angels are subject to, but a passing from the world. Melkor, or, or Morgoth as the elves called him, was the greatest angel of them all. He was once the second most powerful being in the universe. While he's gone, he was not killed in this sense, but rather he was banished. The War of Wrath and its conclusion are a very small part of the Silmarillion, but it isn't uh, all Tolkien wrote about it. And in the history of Middle-earth, we get more detail. It was Eanwa who fought Morgoth and hewed his feet, for example. We know even from the Silmarillion that he was dragged back to Valinor to face judgment, and then he was thrown from the world into the void beyond the doors of night, guarded by Yarendil. Uh, we spoke of earlier, that's Tur's, Tur's son. Tolkien once bandied about the idea that he would return for a final battle, but he later abandoned this thread. So, in a sense, you could say that if death is passing from the world, then, then, then Morgoth has passed from the world. He's no longer in the world, but not in the same way as a mortal who dies. It's different. It's a unique circumstance. Tolkien had planned a revision for his entire mythology. You could read it in the book 
uh, Morgoth's Ring, part of the history of Middle-earth, specifically the part called Myths Transformed, and it never got past the outline phase, and it would have seen the incarnate Melkor actually being executed by the Valar, and then his spirit thrown from the world. So in that case, you really could say that, yes, he really is dead. But this is also the same revision that told us that Angband was on the moon and that the two trees of Valinor never existed. It would have been a complete rewrite from the ground up of, of the entire mythos, and he never really got very far other than just a few ideas that he had. And we're going to talk a little bit later in a question uh, about Tolkien's ideas and how they were ever evolving. Melkor could not be wholly destroyed, though. Too much of his power is tied up in the world itself. So in a way, Morgoth sort of still is in the world because he poured so much of his power into the world. The world was Morgoth's ring. Like Sauron poured his power into a ring. Morgoth poured his power into the earth itself. So the end of Melkor would be the end of the world itself, which is why Tolkien ever only entertained the thought of him being fully annihilated at the very end of the world and in a battle with Turin and Eanwe and Tolkis and Eanwendil as well. But as I said, it was a thread that he later abandoned. So basically, is he alive? It really depends on where you draw the line of what you consider death to be. I would say that he's still alive because he's still out there. He's conscious. He passed from the world in a sense that he was banished from it. But it's a unique circumstance and he left so much of himself behind. And there's a lot of really interesting things in, in it. We, we talked about it in the, in the Council of Tolkien recently about uh, gold and silver and, and the dragon sickness and how Morgoth is sort of the answer to all that. You know, they have it. So I would say that he is sort of still alive because he's still in the world in a sense, or at least his power is in the world. Anyway, uh, let's go on to the next question. Here's a question that came in from Vincius Bascato who asks, After realizing he was so diminished and already being defeated once, did Melkor really expect to win against his enemies, or did he just accept to fight till the bitter end? Um, Melkor thought that no one could stand against him. He was defeated in the past, but it had taken all of the Valar together to do this. When he absconded to Middle-earth with the Silmarils, they did not follow. Tolkis and Orome were in hot pursuit, but then they stopped once Melkor and Ungoliant reached the Helcaraxa. The Valar could not come to Middle-earth, uh, or, or they could, but they really didn't want to. And this meant that nothing was going to stand in his way, or so he thought. It, even then, it took Eanwa and a huge army of elves and Maiar, as well as Yarodil and a flying mithril ship, 40 years to end that war. Melkor saw Middle-earth as his own domain, and he thought that he would be left alone. Melkor um, was wrong, though. He was a coward. He refused to fight Feanor. He only fought Fingolfin due to uh, being perceived as a coward. He was afraid of Tolkis. He was afraid of Orama, despite his might. He was afraid of Eanwa. Um, but he certainly thought that his armies were great enough. It, if not for the intervention of Eärendil and the Eagles, he may have won the War of Wrath. Uh, because the dragons, the flying dragons, really had the, the elves on, on, the, on their last rope there. They, they were being pushed back. So um, he came really close to winning is what I'm getting at. So it's it's not that he he could never win in the sense that of, of what God said to him at the beginning, that, you know, you're going to lose in the end because he'd already dismissed that. But he really did think that he could uh, take over Middle Earth. Absolutely. OK, next question. Here is a question that comes in from Charnindu Udara. I hope I'm saying it right. And they ask, in Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings universe, if Balrogs are Maiars uh, who turned into darkness by Morgoth, then why did Sauron not become a Balrog since he is also a Maiar who turned into darkness under the influence of Morgoth? Okay. First, let me um, address the linguistic thing here. So Maiar is actually plural. Maya is the singular. So there's no Mayars. Maya is plural. Maya is the singular. Uh, you see this a lot with elven words that end with A, 
or or just a vowel in general that they get pluralized by ending an r to to the end of it if the um if the uh, the word is something that ends with a consonant like silmaril ends with an l you would add like an i silmarilli is multiple silmarils we say silmarils all the time uh, and they even say Silmarils in, in, in the books themselves, in, well, in the Lord of the Rings. But um, the, the proper plural in Elvish is Silmaril. I just want to let you know. So the quick answer to the question as to why Sauron did not become a Balrog is because basically he didn't want to become a Balrog. He's much more powerful than the Balrogs. Um, the long answer here is that the Balrogs were among the very first of the Ainur to join Melkor before they even came into the world. Several of the Ainur sang with Melkor during the Ainur Lindala, which is the, the song of creation. And they were his earliest converts, and it is very likely that these spirits became the Balrogs as they entered the world. Sauron, however, was still a student of Aula, who was named Myron, and he would be seduced into Melkor's service early on, but not right there, it was after he entered the world. Now, he is innately a shapeshifter. I mean, as as a matter of fact, all of the Ainur are shapeshifters. It's all of the Valar, all of the Maiar. They're all shapeshifters. They could clothe themselves in different forms as long as they did not incarnate themselves. Then they would be stuck. But Sauron really specialized in it. He was really good at shapeshifting. He could take forms both fair and terrible, and it was useful. So think of it this way. So Sauron is the brains and the Balrogs are, are the brawn. Now that's not to say that he's less powerful. As I said, his talents are far greater, but he's wasted on a battlefield. What he did for Melkor was he created things like vampires and werewolves and he tortured his foes and, and he deceived his foes. So, you know, he was sort of a, a different sort than the Balrogs, and he, he would have been wasted if he just became this fiery demon with a whip and an axe uh, or, or a sword. Gothmog was the one that carried the axe. Um, it, it wouldn't have been as cool, basically. So, uh, yeah, there you have it. Okay, next question. Here is a question that came in from Blair Colquhoun who asks, why weren't the Swan Knights featured in the Lord of the Rings The Return of the King film? So it's really kind of the same reason that the Scouring of the Shire wasn't in the movie. Uh, the movie, as it was, was already really, really long. So keep in mind that these extended editions that we speak about, they're actually the versions that were made. They made those versions and then later they cut them down for shorter theatrical release. Each volume of The Lord of the Rings could easily be two films instead of one. Uh, they're even broken into two books each. This is extremely true, though, of The Return of the King. I know that it's the shortest of the three if you're cutting out the appendices, but there's so much that happens. Um, imagine how long the film would be if the scouring of the Shire was included. People already complained at the time, at least, that there were too many endings. That's what everybody said. There were too many endings and that the film just kept going when they felt it could have ended. People feel differently now because we watch movies in our living room with, with where we can pause and go to the bathroom. But after over three hours in a theater seat, you need to stretch your legs and you need to use the bathroom and it can kind of be like, okay, come on, come on, come on. Um, the Return of the King really should have been two films. If this was the case, then things like The Scouring of the Shire would have been included, as well as major characters like, like Elrond's sons, Halbrad, Berogrand, and his son, and of course Prince Imrahil and the Swan Knights. Uh, we also may have seen more of the Easterlings. Peter Jackson actually wanted to show the War in the North, where they were fighting the dwarves, but the film was going over budget. So what it comes down to is basically they already had a film that was over four hours long, so, yeah, something like Imrahil sort of introducing kind of a major character towards the end of the saga, people would have felt it was, it was more bloated. So that's basically what it comes down to. Okay, next question. Here is a question that comes in from Tyler Stiffens who asks, uh, why do you think Sam is not mentioned or named in the Silmarillion, being referred to only as Frodo's servant. So it's really because of the way that 
the Silmarillion was written, both in-universe and out-of-universe. Frodo's name is mentioned a grand total of one time in the Silmarillion, uh, not counting the Index. Every other reference to him, he's just called the Ring Bearer. Bilbo is never mentioned by name, uh, except in the Index. He's only referred to as the Ring Finder. The final chapter that comprises all of this is of the Rings of Power in the Third Age. And it tells the story of the Lord of the Rings in the same style as the rest of the Silmarillion. Events happen very quickly. It's not a story. It's a chronicle. We're led to believe the author of the final chapter in-universe is Elrond. Elrond would have written this in the few years after Sauron's defeat and before he sailed to the west. It was translated into common speech by Bilbo. Elrond was not writing a story, he was writing a historical chronicle. The more detailed story was written by Bilbo, Frodo, Sam. It's not like Elrond was unaware of this. A lot of it was written in Rivendell and by his friends. So the reason that characters like Sam are hardly a blip in the Silmarillion is because the Lord of the Rings is there to be the more detailed account of that story. Um, somebody named Brian uh, Poshgate left a really fantastic comment that I thought was very funny. Here's a brief synopsis for more information by my good friend's book. That's basically what it comes down to. So he said it, I wouldn't say he said it better than I did, but he said it a lot shorter and more concisely than I did. So I just wanted to just shout out to Brian there for that comment. Okay, next question. Here's another question from the same person, Tyler Stevens, who asks, in the Lord of the Rings, is the island of Tolfun supposed to be Iceland? Um, so as far as analogs to European countries go, and we do have that in the Lord of the Rings, that, that, that has always been my impression, yes. Uh, the, the locations of Europe and Middle-earth match up pretty well, um, although not every place in Europe has an exact analog. For example, there is really no place in Middle-earth that represents Spain or Portugal. But if we match up uh, Oxford in the United Kingdom with Hobbiton, Everything sort of falls into place very nicely, most particular Gondor being Italy. Tolkien had referred to a trip to Italy as being in Gondor. Uh, Dorthonian, also known as Tornifuin, is one of the few surviving lands of Beleriand, which has been destroyed by the War of Wrath. Uh, so basically when Beleriand fell, there was sort of two parts of it that were left. There was Lindon, where the Grey Havens are, and there was Tornifuin, or Dorthonian. Um, so it's the only kind of surviving spot it's out in the sea, and due to its location to the northwest, I would say that, yeah, Iceland is probably the intended analog there. Okay, next question. So here's a question that comes in from Matea Meula, and this is a really interesting one. I alluded to this earlier uh, because I said that we were going to talk about how Tolkien's thoughts were always changing and evolving. Here. So here's the question. Do you agree with Dr. Corey Olson's statement that there is no canon in Tolkien's world? So um, just to give that context before I say whether I agree or not, um, he was speaking about the TV show, The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power on Amazon, and how people get very upset that it, is, it does not follow the canon. And Professor Olson said there really is no Tolkien canon because Tolkien's mind is always uh, changing on things and he was always evolving things. So that's that's the context I wanted to give to that. So I couldn't agree with him more. Um, I think the more correct phase is canon is whatever you will it to be. I have a great respect for Professor Olson. Uh, he is my inspiration for doing this taking my knowledge of Tolkien's world and sharing it in this particular fashion. Um, I said I'd always studied Tolkien ever since I was young uh, for, for, <laughs> for over 30 years at this point. And um, I would always speak about it with like-minded individuals, but I never thought about you know, answering questions and, and doing this sort of thing until I saw Pr Professor Corey Olsen in a video. He doesn't have a YouTube channel. He's on Twitch sometimes though. Um, but I saw him in a video that I believe was for Wired answering people's Tolkien questions and it wasn't that he said anything that I didn't know, but that the way he said it and the way he broke everything down to sort of make sense, you know, to people who may not have read the books, that's what I've always aspired to. 
So I just want to throw that out there that, that Professor Olson is a great inspiration to me, and I have a, a, a great respect for him. And he's absolutely right in this matter. Tolkien canon exists only as far as each individual reader wishes it to. There's two layers to this. The first is that, as Corey Olson points out, Tolkien was always changing his ideas. The Legendarium is unfinished, and the only bits to be published within his lifetime were The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Everything else was published posthumously, an amazing 23 volumes of lore, stories, notes, and scraps, and a lot of it contradicts each other, some of it contradicts the previously published work, and you can you find even more insights in his letters. Um, so, the, so 23 books that he basically wrote with, with notes from his son, and then in addition to that, a book of all of his letters. So there's a lot out there. And he wouldn't approve of it all in the sense that he would say, well, but th that wasn't meant for people to see. That was just an idea I had for like five minutes and I jotted it down. But the world is so hungry for more Tolkien that basically everything gets published. So contradictions can be explained. There are many versions of stories. The Fall of Gondolin, we, we read a bit of the, the final version earlier and I alluded to all the other versions. There's a canon explanation for a canon explanation for the fall of Gondolin that you could read in the Silmarillion. There's an unfinished, more detailed version that was what I read part of earlier, and that doesn't contradict anything in the Silmarillion. But there are complete versions that are completely bonkers off the wall, early drafts that had, for example, thousands of Balrogs. So for the other layer of canon being a dubious concept at best, at least in terms of Tolkien, is we, we can say that these are, you know, the, the Book of Last Tales Part 2, The Fall of Gondolin, that version, the earliest draft, really, that got published, that that's the tale that men told of Gondolin. And the Silmarillion is the tales that elves told of the Fall of Gondolin. And you, we would accept the elvish account as, as canon because that's it's their history. They were there. But did it happen exactly the way they said? There are these are after all just stories. They're they're written in universe by the elves, translated by Bilbo, who was not infallible, and nor did he finish. Sometimes the wrong version was chosen to publish. The Silmarillion, for example, says that Gil Galad's father was 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 uh, it, it wasn't. It, it was. Um... Oh. Oh, actually, no, it was Andover. It, the, the Silmarillion says something else. The Silmarillion got gil father wrong, is what I'm saying. I forget what the Silmarillion actually says, but his father's Andover. Um, and I'm sure somebody will leave a comment about it. Check if somebody left a comment before you leave a comment. Um, so, and this was cor corrected in a later volume. The Peoples of Middle-Earth corrected that. Uh, Tolkien played with the idea that the Silmarillion itself was just a fanciful story. We, we talked about this earlier, about Morgoth's ring and, and uh, uh, myths transformed, that section of Morgoth's ring. The two trees never existed, the lamps never existed, the sun and the moon are the same in nature as they are in reality, the world was always round and Morgoth's fortress was on the moon. So, you know, some people will try to be very rigid and they'll say, well, whatever he wrote last is canon, so do we believe that there are entire other planets where other courts of Valar and that, and that Morgoth was on the moon and all this stuff that absolutely contradicts what was already written? Or, you know, you can choose that. You can absolutely do that. Or you could say, no, there are things in Myths Transform that I think are absolutely bonkers. The Angband being on the moon, to me, is, is wild. I, I can't imagine that being true uh, without the entire thing being rewritten from the from the, from the ground up. But as I said, the Silmarillion is just a story. This is the story that the elves tell. The same stories told otherwise might be the stories that men tell or the stories that hobbits tell. As we talked earlier about the Lord of the Rings versus of the Rings of Power in the Third Age. One is the Elvish account, one is the Hobbit account. The Hobbits were more important in that story, so they have the greater uh, the, the greater 
depth of detail and everything. But there are things in The Lord of the Rings that don't make sense from the standpoint of believing that Frodo and others who were there wrote it. For example, there's a section early on where uh, Frodo and Sam and Pippin are sleeping by the side of the road and a fox walks up to them, sniffs them, and then moves on. But we are privy to the thoughts of the fox. It's, it's referred to the thinking fox. How did Frodo or Sam or any of them or Pippin who was there know that a fox sniffed them and moved on when they were sleeping? And why would they write what they said that the, the fox was thinking? Are they just telling a story? Did it really happen exactly the way they said it? Because that's what canon is, that this is the exact way it happened. It's all stories. It's stories in universe. It's stories out of universe. So no, there really is no such thing as Tolkien canon or that it really only exists in your mind. There are things from myths transformed, as I said, that are completely bonkers. And there are things that I absolutely think are true, such as the orcs. We spoke about this in last week's episode. The orcs being so derived from soulless animals, not from elves. I absolutely believe that that makes sense and that's true. So you kind of have to pick and choose what you choose to believe is canon. And we may come to disagreements in this and that's perfectly okay. That's uh, so I absolutely agree with Professor uh, Corey Olson on that. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Okay, and our next question comes in from Fury, who asks, What if Sauron and Morgoth were servants of a greater power? So, yeah, in a way, they were. Uh, uh, neither Morgoth nor Sauron would see themselves as servants of Iluvatar, God. But they are. Even if they're rebelling against him, Iluvatar made quite the public display out of this, telling Melkor this right in front of everybody else. And I'm going to read you that relevant passage from the Silmarillion. Then Iluvatar spoke and he said, Mighty are the Ainur and mighty among, mightiest among them is Melkor, but that he may know. And all the Ainur that I am Iluvatar, those things that ye have sung, I will show them forth, that ye may see what ye may have done. And thou, Melkor, shall see that no theme may be played that hath not its uttermost source in me, nor can any alter the music in my despite. For he that attempteth this shall prove but mine instrument in the devising of things more wonderful, which he himself hath not imagined. So their power, the power of the Valar, the power of the Maiar, the power of the elves, the power of men, the power of orcs, all of it comes from one source, Iluvatar. And there is nothing that they can do that doesn't serve his will in some way, regardless of how they try. There is nothing that they can do that can diminish the beauty of what he's created in any meaningful way without creating something even more beautiful that they could not foresee. He speaks later to the Valar, demonstrating the idea of things more wonderful in speaking of the bitter cold that Melkor brought to Middle-earth, but he also brought snow, which is beautiful. So in the end, they aren't able to do anything that doesn't lead to something greater. So in that sense, we can say that Melkor and Sauron are indeed servants of Iluvatar, as unwilling as they may be. Okay, next question. Here's a question that came in from Matt Wren, who asks a two-part question this. Firstly, would Durin's Bane have been able to resist Sauron's manipulation in an attempt to claim its allegiance? And secondly, had Sauron achieved this, then would the War of the Last Alliance have ended differently? So I, I don't see any reason that the, the Balrog would want to resist Sauron or, or any reason that Sauron would wish to use manipulation on the Balrog. Uh, well, it is true that in Tolkien's world, as in real life, evil is non-cooperative and evil creatures only team up out of their own self-interest. Durin's Bane would find its own self-interest in joining Sauron, a, a safe haven in Mordor away from agents of the Valar, uh, a, and likely an extremely high rank in his armies. 
The second part, though, doesn't really line up timeline-wise. The Balrog awoke in the Third Age. So unless Sauron just happened to know that one of the Balrogs that fled the War of Wrath happened to make its nest under Khazad-dûm and found his way down there or was able to send somebody down there, he would really have no way of knowing uh, that there was a Balrog there until well after the War of the Last Alliance. Now maybe the War of the Ring would have gone differently. But then again, we you know, then we wouldn't have Gandalf the White. It's a whole thing. So... I like to make this reference that the story is like a tapestry. And when you pull a thread and you start changing things, the whole thing falls apart. Captain Picard understood that. People on Quora don't under always understand that. Okay, next question. Okay, here's a question from Mark Maloney who says, uh, It is written, or is it written anywhere, what factors led to Elros choosing to be human instead of elf who had he come into contact with in the human world that would make him choose it or was it divine intervention of the one from as part of the original plan so it was definitely not divine intervention because that would not force somebody into this sort of choice because that would essentially rob elros of his free will and that's very important that he has that now, why Elrond and Elros made the choices that they did is not something that is written and everywhere. Um, just that those were the choices that they made. It is possible that you could infer from them and, and from their own experiences and from their personalities why, such as they were both raised largely by elves who kidnapped them as boys and that they spent a lot of time around mortals. Perhaps Elros wished to be a king which he did become a king. He was the first king of Numenor. And he would never be a king if he was an elf. My thought is that it was just in his heart. Mortality was also in the heart of his father, Yarendil, though he chose immortality because he didn't want to be sundered and separated from his wife, Elwing, who wanted to be immortal. We are never told the name of the woman that Elros married, who would bear the line of kings that leads all the way down to Aragorn, uh, or even when they met. But if Elros chose mortality, the idea that he may have done so out of love, I think is, is on board uh, for both the character and the author, and I think it's an attractive prospect for the reader as well. So that would be my chosen interpretation, certainly not canon as they say okay next question okay here's one that comes in from zorua galaxy who asks do animals in aman in tolkien's books have a longer lifespan than the elves or are they normal like animals in middle earth oh longer lifespan like the elves okay so it depends on um, where they are, as I said, in Amon, uh, they're, they're immortal, basically. Uh, but in Middle Earth, there are animals that have very long lifespans, and, and there are there are those that do not. Animals are, are usually quite ordinary in Tolkien's world. There's some differences. Birds can talk, both in their own languages, and the likes of Radagast and Saruman are skilled in speaking these languages, and Thorin as well. But uh, they can also speak human speech. A fox's internal monologue is given in the Fellowship of the Ring. I mentioned that earlier. And and the great eagles were, were my our spirits. And yes, they were. Don't make me tap the sign. I'm going to put this, the passage there. There were also the Meiris. They were noble horses of Aman and, and Juan, the hound of Alinor, who may or may not have actually been a Meir himself, depending on when you ask Tolkien. I said, there's no canon because he kept changing his mind. Animals, for the most part, would have natural lifespans, excepting for those that dwell in the Undying Lands, in Aman and, and Talarsea. As the Valar wished to have no death in these lands, they made all of the animals and even all of the plants immortal. They cannot ex extend that grace to children of Iluvatar, though. They can make all, any animal they want immortal. They can make any plant they want immortal, but they cannot mess with the mortality or the immortality of the children of Iluvatar. That's very important. They cannot make elves mortal. They cannot make men immortal. Only Iluvatar can do that. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Mm -hmm. 
Here's a question that comes in from Ethan Howie Marks, who asks, is there anywhere in Middle Earth that represents any part of Africa? Yes, actually, absolutely. Middle Earth is a lot bigger than just the Europe section that we're most familiar with. Uh, there's a whole part to the east that represents Asia, and, and in an early version of The Hobbit, Bilbo even mentions China. Um, and there's an area to the south that represents Africa. This area is generally referred to as Harad, and the men from there were called Haradrim. Uh, but Harad actually just means south, and Haradrim means man from south. So they probably called their countries and their peoples differing things in their own languages. An, an example of the differing perspective can be seen in their name for Gandalf. They called him Inkanis, which means spy of the north. Uh, it's not really a name, it's just sort of they're saying he's a spy, he's from the north. So yes, there absolutely is a, a whole African section down there that is generally referred to as Harad, but that just means south. Okay, next question. Here's a question from Matt Ran who asks, Sauron was clearly a very intelligent being. However, having lived through the first age and seen his masters rise and fall, how did he expect to gain dominion over Middle-earth? Surely he knew his goal of controlling Middle-earth was unattainable. So this is sort of similar to a question we had earlier about well, how could Melkor believe that he could win? Um, the fact is, is that the question is wrong. It was, it was attainable for Sauron, and he very nearly attained it. Sauron had, in fact, learned from his master's defeat and even tried to do good for a time, but he fell back into evil after a few centuries had passed. Sauron came to believe that the Valar had abandoned Middle-earth to chaos and that only he could stem the flow of chaos with order. He doesn't view himself as anything like Morgoth, who was pure evil, and, and Morgoth knew that he was pure evil. Sauron thinks that he's the hero of the story. The Valar would never again send such a host as they did on the first stage, though that war destroyed the, the entirety of Beleriand. The Valar would not risk such destruction again. Sauron worked in the shadows. He built his power slowly, while the Valar's reply was to send five wizards with limited powers. He would have won if the One Ring had not been destroyed, which involved a gambit of the captains of the West launching an assault on Mordor at the right moment to distract him. The One Ring was not Sauron's key to victory. He, he didn't need it. I mean, he wanted it. He really, really wanted it. And he did really, really did not want his enemies to have it, but he, he could win the war without it, and he was, in fact, winning the war without it. It was the key to his defeat, however. The mistake that he made was not accounting for the fact that anyone could possess the ring and not wish to use it, even though he knew that that was the case because of Gollum, he met Gollum, but he believed that anybody like Gollum would never wish to destroy it, and of course he was wrong. And he was wrong about Gollum especially because Gollum was the one who destroyed the ring, in a sense. Okay, and now we're going to move on to our final question. And our final question comes in from Keith Oster, who asks, if the three elven rings of power were forged before the one and had power before the one was forged, why did they diminish after the one was destroyed? So I, I know what most people would say. There's an incorrect fact here because it's based on the TV show, but the answer really actually doesn't change. It doesn't really matter. The three were actually created last, not first. The show did this differently, which is fine because, like I said, the show is very much its own thing. But in the book, they were created in the time between Anatar leaving Eregin and then returning as Sauron to destroy it. This doesn't really change the answer, though. The thing that the show got right about the three, even if they were created at the wrong time, is that they were never touched by Sauron. Regardless of this, though, they were created using his magic and his methods that he taught to Celebrimbor. Uh, think of it as a Trojan horse type situation. Once he created the One Ring, he became aware of the three, and he coveted them greatly. Now, one other thing that the show got very correct was Celebrimbor's death, though it was actually more grisly in the book. They, they followed the same basic idea. He was tortured, he was pelted with arrows, and then, then finally he was skewered. Uh, Sauron in the show did not wave him around like a banner, uh, but I didn't really want to see that anyway, to be honest. What was different, though, was that Sauron was looking for the location of the nine in the show. In the book, he's looking for the three. And all of the other rings, they weren't 
divided into these groups, like the, the seven and then the nine, uh, they were all together, the 16. They were all made for elves. And it was Sauron who gave them later on to, to dwarves and to men. And he chose seven because there were seven dwarf lords. And then he chose nine because he had nine rings left. To put it plainly, the inscription on Sauron's own ring, the one ring, the ruling ring, starts off with one ring to rule them all. Not one ring to rule some, but not others. All of the rings of power, regardless of whether Sauron had a hand in their creation, regardless of when they were created or where they were created, they are all subject to domination by the one. And it didn't matter. Any of that didn't matter because they were made with his ring craft. That's why I said it's sort of like a Trojan horse. They could all fall under his dominion. Okay. I had a lot of fun this week. I think you guys could probably tell, uh, which is funny because I it's actually late. It's, it's like 1 a.m. when I'm recording this and I'm tired, and I had just gotten done with a gaming stream on my Twitch channel, and I'm just very tired. I had a bad allergy day today. I I still have to go and like uh, put sheets on the bed because I did laundry today. And so it's like, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so tired. I, I was like, maybe, I was actually considering not doing an episode this week and like putting something else up in its place. And then I was like, no, 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 I gotta do it, I gotta do it. And then I start talking and I start smiling and I start having fun and I start getting exuberant. And really it's like one of these things that like, yeah, once I start doing it, I realize why I do it because I love it. So if, you, if you're at this point in the video, you've gotten all the way through it, subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, show the videos to some friends. Leave me some comments. Help me with the algorithm. You guys have been doing this already, but I have to say keep on doing what you're doing because it's been great. Uh, I will see you guys next week. Consider membership. You get to see all the videos early, at least a week early, sometimes more than that. And it's a very small and very cheap way of supporting me even further. We'll see you guys next time.